Welcome. Everything is great. You are listening to Forking Bullshirt, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. We'll be the architects of your journey into the afterlife. This week, we're talking about Season 2, Episode 10, Best Self. This episode was written by Tyler Stracel. I want to say that's how you pronounce that name. So I'm sorry if it's not. And it was directed by Julianne Robinson, and it aired January 11th, 2018. All right, so we got a hold of the extended episodes. Finally! Uh, We watched the extended episode for the best self, and if you have the ability to, we recommend you watch it. Yeah, there's a lot of great added stuff in there that we think is really important, and we are a little bit miffed that it was cut. A little. A little miffed. Yeah, there's there's even some Jason growth in there. Yeah, exactly. And Jason has such little growth. Could you please give him some? Mm Mm-hmm. Keep it in the episode, guys. All right, shall we get right into it? The four humans convince Michael that they need to leave immediately, and he reveals their method of travel. A freaking gold balloon! Michael asks for a few minutes to figure out the controls, and the humans discuss their hopes for the real good place. Okay, so right off the bat, in the extended episode, Michael says that they'll be sneaking in through a side door, and he doesn't know if they'll let them stay. And Michael encourages them to say goodbye to their home, and kind of reminisce so that's why we have them sitting around eating frozen yogurt in the next scene Mm -hmm. which seems a little bit confusing when you don't have that moment of knowing that michael's working on something you're sort of wondering okay well they want to leave right away but why are they sitting there eating frozen yogurt exactly and you also get the great moment of tahani trying to board the balloon before michael tells them how to and it just gives her problems and he's like stop that just stop Of course, she's impatient to get on it. Well, yeah, she wants to pre-board. Yes. (laughs) Very good point. And then Tahani's outfit change only really makes sense in the extended episode because she mentions changing into a proper ballooning outfit, which Eleanor is very excited to see. So that's nice. Nice to see our girls getting along. They Mm -hmm. haven't been doing that very much this reboot. So, Mm -hmm. And we get another little callback when the cast is eating frozen yogurt. Chidi's toppings are almonds, which I love. It's so great. (laughs) And it just, it always makes me think of, you know, Chidi freaking out about the almond milk. It shows a little bit of growth for him. Like he's finally accepted that maybe that wasn't the reason why he was in the bad place. Hmm. Yeah, maybe not. Maybe not. Plus, any scene with them eating the frozen yogurt now just makes me laugh because I know it's mashed potatoes. (laughs) So it just kind of... There's that one moment of, oh, man, they're eating potatoes. Those are savory, but they've got all this sweet stuff on it. Oh, oh no. I mean, mashed potatoes are great, but... Not with not gummy with bears. And, no. Yeah. no, almonds almonds are not a thing you put in potatoes. Hmm. Someone's going to send me a recipe of, like, perfect mashed almond potatoes, whatever. Gross. Yeah, no. Uh-uh. Disagree on that one. Okay. So then we get everybody wondering about what heaven will be like, right? What the good place, the real good place is going to be like. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of intrigued by the idea that everybody's good place could actually be in the same place. Because Eleanor is talking about a beach, right? Which you could have a beach next to a town where Tahani could have her huge house with a moat. Which could have a giant library where Chidi... You know, spends all day with the AC on max, Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And Jason could have frozen yogurt. Like, none of them say anything that's too outrageous. Yeah. And none of them say anything that really, like, contradicts. Their idea of heaven is very down to earth. (laughs) Yeah, it's true. (laughs) It is. It's, It's interesting. They're not just going out of their mind thinking of the most bizarre things. Mm -hmm. Like, I want my own private vista on Mars. Mm. And I like that Tahani says that she wants all of them to be together, even if they're in separate houses. You know? That was fascinating to me. That yeah. was that comment was really interesting because that's huge for Tahani. Like she likes these people. They're her friends now. And it's not in a condescending way. Yeah. These are people that she cares about and has grown to like and maybe even love. And it didn't feel like. Her comment about, oh, of course, I'd like all of us to be together felt really genuine. And then she added in, oh, but then in separate houses. 
But it wasn't that flipped, right? It wasn't, oh, I want to have my huge house. Oh, but also you guys are totally there. Right. That would have totally changed the tone of her, her comment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It felt genuine. It was nice. Do you think the good, the actual good place is similar to what Michael's version of the good place is? Neighborhoods with everybody having their own personal house or whatever, kind of all interacting, just a bunch of neighborhoods separately? Or do you think it's like individual, individual slices of heaven? I don't know. Um... Or like the version that everybody sees on TV, puffy clouds, everyone wandering around in robes with harps, everybody. (laughs) But the takeaway from that one is everyone's together. There's no like villages or like little neighborhoods. Everyone's just communal harping. Yeah, but that sounds like the bad place to me. Yeah. Because other people are around me all the time. (laughs) And that sounds awful. Right. (laughs) Um, Definitely an introvert over here. So... Yeah, I don't I don't know. I want to say individual slices of heaven because everyone's idea of the good place, this amazing afterlife would be different, right? Precisely. But at the same time, I feel like in the show, they're going to show us something that surprises us, I think. If we ever do actually get to see the real good place, I don't think it's going to look like this neighborhood. And I don't think it's going to look like individual little bubbles of time and space mm-hmm. either. So I'm open to seeing what they've got for me. Yeah. Yeah. I've been watching Supernatural recently and there is a mention of, I'm going to put heaven in quotes here, quote unquote heaven, being very similar to what The Good Place has presented us with the neighborhoods. People in heaven, uh, they have their own slice of land, I guess you'd call it, in, in the afterlife. Everyone's got their own personal place and what their dream would be so someone could own for example own a bar and they would just that would be their favorite place and they would just love to have be living there for the rest of eternity and one person could be on the beach and etc but Mm. everyone has their own little slice of perfection yeah of (laughs) heaven so yeah but it's it's important to note that this show is not showing us heaven because Mm -hmm. heaven is of course an earthly construct that we've all kind of gathered from the bible and all that stuff but the show is straying away from religion Mm -hmm. importantly showing us something unexpected as you said Mm -hmm. this episode marks yet another bottle episode Mm. the entire episode takes place near the train station uh in the town square or the quad i guess yeah so this is like number four almost i think possibly oh wow okay so there's been a lot Wait, not number four this season. Yes. Team Cockroach was one because they spent the majority of the episode in Eleanor's house. Yep. Um, What were the other ones? Janet and Michael? Janet and Michael. Kind of similar. Yeah. Most of the episode was spent in Michael's office working with Janet. Yep. Then what? Number three is technically the trolley problem. Okay. Because they're all in the classroom environment, but they also kind of teleport onto the trolley and the medical room and so we're we're technically bottle episode number three for that one okay but i can understand if people want to disagree with me for that Mm. i'm gonna say three and a half bottle episodes (laughs) okay three and a half bottle episodes three and a broken bottle ah okay (laughs) three and a shank (laughs) a shank okay Three in the old face shredder. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop right here. there. Okay. Um, yeah, they do seem to be enjoying them this season. Mm-hmm. For sure. I like this one. This is my favorite. Yep. Yep. I, the trolley problem was great too, though, to be honest. That one was fantastic. Uh, and Janet and Michael. I really, I just, I think I like all of them. <laughs> they are all very good and important. Mm-hmm. All right. So moving on. Janet reads the instructions for the balloon. It will only transport those who have attained self-realization. A scale will weigh the soul of each traveler, and if they are the best version of themselves, it will permit them to board. The scale turns green for Eleanor, Tahani, and Jason, allowing them to board. Chidi, however, is refused entry. Surprise, surprise. Ah, boy. Yeah, okay, the music that they've got during that scene 
when the humans are slowly all stepping up to the scale is very melancholic. Like it's really kind of sad. And it reminded me of something from the Last of Us soundtrack. Hmm. So it kind of cues you to just know that something bad is going to happen. Right. You know that this isn't going to go well, but not necessarily sure who it's going to go badly for. And then when Janet read the instructions, I actually immediately thought of um, an Egyptian god of mummification and the afterlife. Uh, his name was Anubis, mm-hmm. and he was the guardian of the scales. Does he have the, the dog head? Yeah, he does. Yeah. So at the time of death, Anubis would perform a measurement to determine if a person was worthy of entering the afterlife. He would weigh your heart against the truth, which was often represented by an ostrich feather. And if your heart was heavier than the feather, your soul would be devoured by another demon. And if your heart was lighter, you would be granted access to the heavenly existence. So that's immediately what I thought of. When you see the scale, it's just obviously your soul isn't going to be devoured exactly, but you are going to be sent to the bad place if you can't board on this method of transportation to the good place, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of equivalent. That's really neat. I had no idea about the scale. Yeah. I only recently learned about Anubis from American Gods. Um, I read the novel and I watched the Stars adaptation um, and got a lot of great info from the Shadows and Shamblers podcast. You should check it out if you're a fan of American Gods. It's great. So what do you think of the instructions for the balloon? Did they make you think of anything? Did they feel legit? Like before you got to the point where Michael just confesses that it's a fake and he never really had any idea of how to get them there. Did you buy the instructions? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Um, It seemed like something that Michael would steal from somewhere or ask Janet to procure from somewhere legitimate. Yeah. Yeah. Could be, uh, it looks like it could have been written in Enochian. If we're uh, fans of Supernatural, it's angelic writing. Oh, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was really interesting. It felt sort of like like an ancient method of transportation. Just the way that the instructions were told by Janet, it felt very real. So Michael came up with something really convincing. It looked to me like, like an old Da Vinci blueprint, Ooh. like from one of his inventions. Yeah. Just little sketches and then a ridiculous amount of writing and just, yeah. Okay. No, I like that. That's really cool. So in terms of philosophy, this idea of self-realization, that kind of stuck in my head when Janet said it um, because it made me think of Aristotle. And I have a... Nerd. <sighs> I know. Okay, fine. <laughs> um and I thought back to to our conversation on him during season one. I can't remember which episode now. So I found a little quote here from um, a scholarly article. <laughs> <laughs> Shush. All but right, ex- Chidi, break it out. Okay, so it explained it better than I can because it's been a week. Anyway, so the clearest formulation of the ethics of self-realization goes back to Aristotle. According to him, the best way of finding out how man can gain happiness is to discover wherein his particular nature and thus virtue or excellence really lies. The particular excellence of a knife, for example, is that it cuts well, and that of a horse is that it runs well. So man's excellence lies in something that he alone possesses, his rational faculty. Since he is a rational animal, his self-realization is to be sought in his exercise of reason. A man who does not exercise this particular human capacity or faculty is not exercising his capacity as a man and is not realizing within himself the kind of happiness of which only human beings are capable. So that was intriguing to me because we know that they've been taking these philosophy classes from Chidi, right? Right. So really all of them have achieved some sort of self-realization because they've all been working that muscle. Well, it makes sense if you're paying attention and if you kind of look back and what the philosophers have to say about this subject. And you're absolutely right. Like, they're all exercising their faculty of reason. Mm -hmm. And they're just... Even Jason. 
even Jason, he has been thinking about this stuff. He has and, been participating in his lessons. Yeah, and despite it being cut from the episode, there is a scene that demonstrates this. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's nice that it all makes sense. And Eleanor's first reaction is, well, I'm definitely my best self because I've been learning a shirt ton about ethics. Whether and... or not she believes <laughs> what she's saying, it's right. It's, it's true. true. Yeah, absolutely. She says she's been reading books that weren't even written by the real housewives. Like, that's great. She has been. Even if she can't remember Kierkegaard's name, which, how do you not remember Kierkegaard's name? It's like, anyway, she has been reading all of those books. She has been participating in her lessons and she has grown as a person. So all of this she has been doing. She has been exercising that particular human capacity for reasoning. So good job, good place writers. (laughs) So the fact alone that all three of them get the green light proves that Chidi should get the green light Mm -hmm. until he starts thinking about it. Of course. Yeah. Because we know Chidi (laughs) and he overanalyzes absolutely everything to death. So that... He would love this podcast. I would hope so. Chidi. I would hope so too. He's dead. Oh, he got crushed by an air conditioner. Okay, harsh. (laughs) All right. So let's continue. Chidi shares his fear that he is not the best version of himself. Eleanor calms and comforts him and they try to board again. This time, Eleanor is refused entry. Eleanor admits that she feels like the version of herself from the VHS tape was better than her. Tahani insists that those who are the best versions of themselves go ahead but then she is refused passage. Wah, wah. Yeah. Surprise, <laughs> surprise. You just lost everything about you being your best self and went back to your selfish self. Mm-hmm. So I like this. I like that we're playing on all the reboots here. Chidi actually just points out, hey, best version of ourselves is not a metaphor. There have been so many versions of us. And... I like that that's overwhelming for him because that's super overwhelming. Mm -hmm. It just makes sense that he would react this way. It seems so in character, so genuine. And then he's panicking about every little possible thing, right? He says in the extended episode, it doesn't just mean, are we the nicest we've ever been or something? Except I'm worried about that too. (laughs) And right there, you can tell that he doesn't understand what does best version mean. Because best is so incredibly subjective. Right. So does it mean the most reasonable person, the most rational person? What does that mean? And I think that in that moment, I would react very similarly. Like, how am I supposed to understand if I'm the best version of myself if I can't remember any of the other ones? Mm -hmm. To be fair, Chidi also mentions... Whether he is real or an imposter, Mm -hmm. which is really interesting to me because he seems to be mixing up different theories as well. Oh, yeah. And he's almost mixing up the many worlds theory, Uh, the many worlds theory or interpretation or even the multiverse hypothesis. Oh, multiverse. I think I might have heard that word a few times. (laughs) We know and Chidi should know that he is the exact same as all the other cheaties. Mm -hmm. It's just his memory has been wiped. Right. Now, does that, that just means his physical body is the same, but does that mean his mental, like his, his mind, his mind, is his mind the same? Yes. It's just the memories are changed. His mind is still the same because he still lived on earth. He still had all those memories then all his lives. Then it's just the moments in the afterlife, in the quote-unquote good place, have been wiped. Yeah, but we know from this show, we know that this show, their philosophy is that memories change who you are, right? right? And your actions change who you are. Absolutely. Even after death, right? Eleanor, Tahani, and Jason have all changed. Chidi has also changed, but maybe doesn't believe it at the moment or Mm -hmm. doesn't know how much. So, I don't know. I I get it at this moment where he doesn't really... The whole idea of, like, am I not real is a little bit 
more far fetched. And I think I think that's just cheaty starting to panic even more and more and more and get these bigger and worse thoughts in his head. It's just a snowball that's just getting bigger and bigger of anxieties and issues. And it's cheaty. Yeah, he's spiraling. Right. Absolutely. So I thought that was kind of fun that you can kind of get all his panicky thoughts Mm -hmm. in those few sentences, like all the things that he's actually thinking about. Mm -hmm. And he brings up a few different things. He brings up um, in the extended episode, David Hume and his thoughts on consciousness and that it is constantly changing, which apparently is playing on the Buddhist doctrine of the non-self. And then he brings up that physically our bodies change every seven years because, you know, our cells regenerate, our skin dies, our bones adapt and grow. I'm not really sure how that works. But you didn't come to this podcast for medical stuff. So anyway, bodies change often. So I just wanted to quickly talk about David Hume and... Buddhist theory. So we've talked a little bit about David Hume before. We've talked about his bundle theory of the self and me being kind of a cheaty. I found another quote from a scholarly article, so I'm going to read it to you now. There are some philosophers who imagine we are at every moment conscious of what we call our self, that we feel its existence and continuance in existence, and we are certain beyond the evidence of a demonstration, both in its perfect identity and simplicity. But from what impression could this idea be derived? For my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, I always stumble on some particular perception or other, of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. I can never catch myself at any time without a perception, and can never observe anything but the perception. I may venture to affirm that persons are nothing but a bundle of collections of different perceptions, which succeed each other with an inconceivable rapidity and are in perpetual flux and movement. So basically, that we are constantly changing and that we are really just a sum of our experiences, whether that is love, hatred, pain, pleasure, heat, cold. We don't really exist without those things. We can't just sit here and not have any of that. Yeah. We are always at the mercy of our surroundings. We are ever-changing. So I like that idea. I pretty much agree with that idea. It doesn't seem very far-fetched or out there. No, and it really agrees with what Chidi is thinking at the moment. Like, his consciousness is ever-changing and has been ever-changing over all of these reboots. So... He is still himself. He may not have the memories of his love of Eleanor, for example, but he is still cheaty. He is still a good person and he should be able to board. Yeah. And now to touch quickly, quickly on Buddhist theory, um, which Chidi says that Hume's bundle theory is really derived from the Buddhist doctrine of the non-self. Um, I didn't really know too much about this, so I googled quickly, and I found out that Buddhists do not believe that at the core of all human beings and living creatures, there is any eternal, essential, and absolute something called a soul or self. So Buddhism apparently from its earliest days has denied the existence of the self or soul in its texts. Interesting. So really at this moment, Chidi is having a philosophy overdose. I really liked... Eleanor's comforting remarks. I really liked what she said. I thought it was very sweet. It was very honest and genuine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So can I try and sum up that this moment and see if I get a grasp on it? Okay. So Eleanor helps Chidi understand that the best version of himself is reflected on the people around him and the impact he's made on their lives. Mm-hmm. And despite that, he... Despite all that he thinks about his own problems, and we know there are plenty, Mm -hmm. or even if other versions of him were better, they didn't have the same impact. They didn't have the same impact on his surroundings as GD number 802. But from what I understand, that doesn't mean that the other cheaties were any worse. Mm -hmm. It just means that at this point, this cheaty is the best version of himself. 
-hmm. So there might be, if the iterations continued, there could be Chidi 810 that was the best version of himself. Mm -hmm. So he just didn't quite grasp the idea that his surroundings were soaking up his goodness and his impact on them was making him the best version of him. Mm -hmm. And I think that the circumstances that led to this moment were not necessarily created entirely by Chidi, right? They've been created by the whole group of them. Of course, yeah. But this is the only version where Michael got involved in ethics lessons. And that was primarily because of Eleanor, mainly using it as a way to keep... It's like blackmail, right? Yeah, yeah. Kind of keep him in check. But also, Chidi was able to reach out to another person and actually make a change in Michael. Mm -hmm. Michael could have, and I guess we'll still see if this ends up being a twist, but Michael could have been just faking how good he has become and how ethical he is now. But Right, so just branching off of that, um, the show has laid the groundwork for Michael's betrayal if it were to go in that direction, which I don't think they will. But I really if, hope they, if they suddenly decided to, mm-hmm. the hints have been there. Yeah. And even in episode four, Michael actually, he says, um, hit him with the big puppy dog eyes. Please, sir, take pity on me. I've changed. And all that crap. Mm-hmm. That's what he wants to say to the good place in right. order to get in. Oh, no. So, like, the hints are there, but I don't think it's going to happen. I really don't want them to. They're Please not They're not that. going to. 99.9% sure because okay. everyone's expecting it. But at the same time, they're like, they wouldn't do that because they've already done that. So the show, the writers are smarter than that. And I'm sure Michael Schur is a lot smarter than that, too. But they are kind of keeping us in this little limbo of they not are. knowing. And that's really clever. There's all these little subtle moments, like even in this episode, Michael straight up has been lying to them mm-hmm. since episode four. Yeah. And a lot of people have been saying that maybe this was Michael's plan all along to get them to actually agree to go to the bad place. Oh. Yeah. So the groundwork is definitely there. I'm just hoping it doesn't happen. I really hope it doesn't happen. Why force them if you can just walk them to it? Yeah. If they can willingly go there themselves. Exactly. That's clever. I don't Mm -hmm. like it, but it's clever. Uh Uh-huh. It is. So going back to Chidi. What I really liked about his interpretation of Eleanor's advice is that this is the true reason that he was sent to the bad place because he didn't realize any of this when he was still alive. He didn't realize that the best version of himself is just as much about his effect on the world around him as it was about his own egocentric self-image, right? Right, right. So he had such a negative effect on the world around him. All (laughs) these people, he made them so miserable. He really did. But if he had realized that morality is more than just studying, is maybe trying to make the world a better place, maybe he would never have been sent to the bad place. Right. That's an important lesson for him to learn at this point. I mean, it's it's a little late, possibly. Because he's dead. Because he's dead. (laughs) <laughs> and he's already in the bad place but yeah i just i really liked it it was like something that he never really had thought too much about mm-hmm. and then eleanor just very simply gives him this huge life lesson he becomes a student for a moment and it's really great yeah and then he has that really sweet moment where he's like did i really mean that much to you guys and eleanor just without hesitation says of course genuinely of course like not even like yeah just no bullshit. Yeah. Of course. Why would you even ask that? Yeah. Eleanor and Chidi are like breaking my freaking heart this episode. It's not fair. Okay. We'll continue. <laughs> so, of course, that leads to Eleanor. Mm-hmm. Not thinking she's the best version because suddenly Chidi doesn't love this version of Eleanor. Well, I don't know if it's so much that she doesn't feel loved by Chidi in this version. I think it's more that Chidi was open and vulnerable with them when he was panicking. And then she sort of realized, I'm still not being open with him. I'm not telling him something that's important. I didn't, I've never told him that I have feelings for him. Ah, I did not get that at all. 
No? I didn't get that. What? I, well, not even no, a little that's, bit. That's my interpretation. No, but, of course. But that makes yeah. total sense because of her honest moment right after that when she mm -hmm. tells him, like, look, I haven't been honest with you. I still have feelings for you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I just took it as, well, I clearly can't be the best version of me if Chidi doesn't love me in this version. Aww. That's heartbreaking too, though. Oh, I know. That's why. That's okay. That's why <laughs> you sad. went for the pain. <laughs> I, that, that's why I assumed it was really sad. Uh, okay. But it makes sense with the script and what we've seen after these moments happen from your interpretation. Yeah. Plus, we get that moment of Jason admitting that he's not his belt best self because he's avoiding Tahani and her insistence on discussing their relationship. And he's been avoiding talking to Janet about their past relationship. Yeah, that's in the extended episode. Yeah. So that's Jason admitting to everybody that he is avoiding being emotional and being open. He's scared to do it. Yeah, he's avoiding having a tough conversation because I think he knows that Tahani's going to have something not so pleasant to talk to him about. Yeah, and that's huge for Jason. Yeah. The little guy who's like distracted by sparklers and a Pikachu balloon and Yeah, there are some thoughts going on in that noggin. It's not just space and air and Blake Bortles. Yeah. This was I a... mean a lot of it is Blake Bortles, so <laughs> <laughs> if we saw like a, a diagram of Jason's brain, most of it would like have... a pie chart. Like a, a... there's like a tiny yeah. sliver of like actual thoughts and the rest of it is the Jacksonville Jaguars. Right. Ooh, I want that now. I want someone to make me a pie chart. Make well, it, me a pie chart. It'll just it'll just be like an old timey brain diagram with Ooh. like sections like devoted to. Oh, yeah. okay, okay, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Um, so at this moment in the extended episode, Janet shows the humans that she's got these treats packed for them on the trip, which is not explained again in the other one. Yeah, I don't know whether anybody. I, I mean, come on. You're watching the episode on air, live. Janet's holding this basket of goodies. Never mentioned. Never brought up. Nobody points it out. Which you don't need to do. I mean, I it's understandable, like, hey, she packed goodies for the trip. But it's nice to see what's in there. What's in that basket, yeah. little Janet? It's clever. It's funny. It's a great moment. Yeah. Okay, so the one that I don't get, though, what she says she packs... Okay. So she tells us what she packed for everybody. Twizzlers for Jason. Hard-boiled eggs for Chidi, which makes perfect sense because I love you too, egg. <laughs> Shrimp for Eleanor. And fancy crisps for Tahani. Um, the name is definitely a shout out to you. Oh, yeah. I bet. Totally. totally. I'm Lord Vivian and I here are my cuttlefish crisps. <laughs> So what? gross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what did she say, too? Like, ooh, not something? They're not pickled? Oh. Unpickled? She's like, oh, unpickled? No, thank you. <sighs> Tahani. <laughs> Always too good for something. And Janet's just offended. Yeah. I would be, too. But I really feel like Jason should have those chicken wings from Stupid Nick's Wing Dump or whatever it is. Oh, weren't they, like... Were they chicken wings or were they mozzarella sticks? Or... No, they were chicken wings. Okay. Also, oh, oh, he could jalapeno have had poppers. jalapeno poppers. Where did the Twizzlers come from? Maybe Janet is still angry with Jason and she was like, mm. uh -huh, you get Twizzlers. That is your 10th favorite snack. Definitely not going to give you the nine first. Bitter. Mm, maybe a little. I'm thinking yes. So now, do you think that the scale actually worked in any way? Or do you think it was just a pattern, like Jason said? Oh, I think it worked. Yeah? I think it worked. But, but uh, based on what? Exactly what Michael said it was. Oh. But so he knew them all so well that they would not get in. Mm. I was okay. thinking maybe he had like a button in his coat or something that he would just press red. And, oh. And then <laughs> immediately they would admit, be like, oh, of course it's red because of yada, yada, yada. And you're like. Right. And then he would just sit there and be like, mm-hmm, yep, let's get them to admit their faults every <laughs> single time I press red because I'm still torturing them. Oh, no. it would be a good, yeah. good way to do it. But I think it worked legitimately because Janet breaks it. Yeah, that's a good point. That's true. Although he could have a special Janet button. 
<laughs> or he presses them both at the same time. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a good moment. And I like the little, I'm assuming it's a subtle callback to the first episode of the series when Eleanor shows us this good neck, this gold necklace that she stole from Tahani's house. Because in the first episode of the series, she says, when she's drunk, I just go, need to go steal some gold stuff. And maybe this version, she did the exact same thing. Maybe she did. Yeah. Wouldn't put it past her. Nah. So I'm really happy that we got a little bit more information about the Eleanor and Chidi romance reboot, Mm -hmm. is what I'm going to call it now. But from what Mindy tells us, that wasn't the only time they had some sort of romance. How many times was it? Eight? Five? Yeah, like eight different sessions, but like a bunch of different times or something like that is what she right. said. So it happened more than once. So what made Michael pick that version? Maybe that was the one where Eleanor said she loved him. Or maybe that was the one that she had the tape of. So there was... Yeah. There could have been other tapes, but she didn't have those ones. Yeah, but I feel like that's the only one where they actually said I love you to each other. It could be. And that's why it was special. Right. Yeah. Maybe the other times it was just, hey, you're here, I'm here, let's bone. Let's bone. Which I get it. I get it. So. And uh, hey, uh, Michael, if you've got any info on that uh, Eleanor and Tahani one, then just slide that under my door. Yeah, just let us know. Just uh, tell us about that one. Super subtle. It's for it's for a friend. It's for science. Just some research. Just science. <laughs> um, and I really love Tahani's little meltdown when she speaks to the <laughs> this scale. Is my, it's like, so funny. like it's a dumb child, and she's like, "It is I, Tahani." <laughs> It's a great she moment. She probably thinks I'm Eleanor. <laughs> oh, so good. And of course, when Janet breaks the scale, and she, yeah, Tahani says, oh, my scale, you broke my scale. And Eleanor says, it's not your scale. And Tahani looks so offended for like a split second. I love that moment for Jamila Jamil. It's so good. Oh, she's really great. Yeah. And we get Janet being really peeved at the possibility that she's not her best self she's very offended this is yeah. unlike any normal janet mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and janet really has been avoiding jason yep when she was drunk last episode she was like eh, i love you guys except for you jason i hate you i'm like <laughs> nah girl talk about your feelings okay You're very mature janet yeah moving on As everyone unravels, Michael admits that the balloon is a fake, and he doesn't actually know how to get to the real good place. Surprise, surprise. They realize that they're all out of options and decide to ignore their problems and drink heavily. Tahani breaks up with Jason, and Eleanor finally talks to Chidi about her feelings. This is the part of the episode that makes me want to die a little inside. Because... Eleanor and Chidi, guys! Eleanor and Chidi! I have feelings! (sighs) <sighs> and the extended episode is so much better if you are a fan of these two because their conversation is longer and Chidi says that he could have loved her and she has a very symmetrical face. It's quite sweet. So what do you think about Jason and Tahani? They are not a couple anymore. Let me cry my tears. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. You're so upset. <laughs> I'm so sad about it. <laughs> I like the way it happened because this was Jason asking her and finally having that conversation that he knew had to happen. Mm -hmm. So are we okay? No, we're not. I think we need to break up. And it was good because Jason actually helped lighten the mood with his stupid story. And again, for the characters, but also for the audience. And then it was all a dream. Long story short. (laughs) A lot of people have been saying that what if the show ended up to all be a dream or like their life has been flashing before their eyes and they're going to wake up in the ambulance or whatever. What if they were really dead the whole time? What if they were <laughs> dead the whole time? You Rewatch that episode, you weirdos. Gosh, darn it. <laughs> Jason has a lot of feelings about the finale of Lost. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, 
I think this was a moment where a lot of people latched on who believed that maybe everybody would wake up in the hospital or something. And mm-hmm. like, they and they were, were all just lying next to each other and had yeah. somehow invaded each other's dreams. Exactly. And then the show becomes about like dream walking instead. Ooh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't want that. Scratch that. Reverse. No, I, I think it's a good moment. It's nice that Tahani has become more self-aware. She knows that she has this habit of clinging on to people and relying on them for for her self-worth. And, and saying, I would simply say, I would like to speak to your manager mm-hmm. in situations that are out of her control. Yeah. And in that moment, I love, she looks past Jason and Jason looks behind him expecting to see a manager <laughs> or something. That's so perfect. I absolutely love it. Like there's just a Walmart manager, like just right behind him. Oh, hi. I'm He's got like a clipboard. <laughs> I'll go see what I can do. <laughs> like, yeah. I'll go get the breakup forms. <laughs> I just think it's a really good moment of growth for her. Um, I think it's important that her character gets a little bit of growth because... Very much so. Yeah. We haven't really seen too much of that from Tahani this season. I feel like we're getting a lot of jokes from her and a lot of name dropping, which is what Tahani does best, but we need a little depth too. Yeah. And this episode is full of depth for all the characters, and I applaud that. Mm-hmm. All right. So then we get Eleanor and Chidi. And I love that Eleanor starts off by saying, okay, so feelings are stupid. But in the possibility that feelings aren't stupid. And then she's just honest. She just says it like it is. She doesn't expect Chidi to suddenly say something like, oh, well, I just realized today that I love you too. Let's get married. Even though what does that even mean in the afterlife? Yeah. Yeah. She just says it because she knows that she should be honest. And she doesn't even want him to say anything because she gets awkward and emotional conversations and you can Mm -hmm. tell because she immediately turns around and is like I don't want to no I don't want to fine I'll listen oh and Chidi says in the extended episode guys watch it please he says it's not that I couldn't love you you're amazing and fearless and clearly symmetrical he was calling her a babe oh yeah he was like dang you hot um I really hate that they cut that part out I get that you can pretty much infer that Chidi could have had feelings for Eleanor. It's not like out of the realm of possibility, but it's nice to hear him actually say it to her. Like, Mm -hmm. I could have loved you. It's just these circumstances are so insane that I can't even think about a relationship. So basically, the too long didn't read summary of my feelings is wailing awkwardly because Chidi and Eleanor, Chidi and Eleanor are amazing and I want them together forever. With no babies because it's the afterlife. Yeah, how does that even work? They wouldn't. Right. Okay. Unless you just ask Janet for a baby. Oh, that seems a little morbid, though. You're asking Janet for a dead baby. No, she made Derek. Because they're dead. She made Derek. Yeah, but Derek's not technically alive. So you'd be asking Janet for a dead baby because they're all dead. (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) Janet, bring me a dead baby. (laughs) Okay, okay, okay. Okay, back no. that up. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Janet, take back the dead baby. I don't, I regret asking Rewind, rewind. <laughs> okay. So what, uh, what do you think about Eleanor and Chidi and their beautiful moment of openness? I think it was nice. Yeah. Because it was Eleanor being honest with herself. Hmm. I think it was more for herself than for Chidi. Being able to speak what... Mm-hmm. She feels, Mm -hmm. and that's something that she hardly ever does because she has like 800 walls to put up. Mm -hmm. And what about Chidi's side? What about it? Expressing what it feels like to be in his mind and why he isn't able to return her feelings at the moment. Chidi actually is able to talk to her without getting all anxious and suddenly having like these anxiety attacks. Mm-hmm. Being able to mm-hmm. spell out what he's actually thinking. Which yeah. Is kind of nice. Because in season one, when she says, I want to stay here because I love you, his reaction is like, uh, I have to leave now. Yeah. And I will not be back for several days. I mean, that was like three's a crowd, right? There was yeah. three of them after him. True. But his reaction to Eleanor being in love with him was just to be silent. Yeah. 
And then when he finds out about the tape and potential feelings, his first instinct is to overcompensate and tell her how much she means to him, but as a friend. Yeah. And here we just... They just have a conversation. He's calmer. He knows that she's not expecting anything from him. And I kind of wonder if that's going to be something that actually makes him fall in love with her. Hmm. Like knowing that she can be honest about her feelings, but without an expectation of him. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Making him comfortable. Because that's attractive. Hell yeah, it is. Continuing on. Eleanor toasts to the good people they've all become. The gang declares Michael an honorary human and presents him with a human starter kit, and they party the night away. During conversations, Tahani asks Michael about the judge that presides over both realms. Michael explains they would need to travel through the real bad place to get to the judge, and the humans decide to go, despite that being terribly insane. insane. The next morning, they pile onto the train, and as they leave, they see the neighborhood slowly being erased. So... So, okay, let's let's back it let's back to it back. the... Yeah, let's go back to the little party. Okay. When Chidi toasts to Michael, the look on Michael's face is so perfect. He's just finished telling them he lied, that he can't get them into the good place, and he's feeling super guilty and sad and depressed. Mm-hmm. And these four humans forgive him. They understand his faults, and they're celebrating him. Mm-hmm. And he is so overwhelmed it looks like Mm -hmm. like he's just realizing a little bit more what it means to be human and how good these people are and how friendly they can be and how amazing they are etc etc he's full of emotion he's learning about forgiveness yeah and it's hard to not trust him at that point like how can you think that he's still lying yeah yeah i don't think he is i really don't yeah That was not the impression I got when I left this episode. Exactly. Me neither. So if anybody is still on the Michaels duping them train, I don't know, maybe watch the episode again. Watch Michael because we know the facial expressions are very important and nonverbal communication is huge on the show. I don't know. I think the the proof is in the the face. Mm. Really just seeing everybody getting along and kind of ribbing each other playfully with Eleanor's little comments about Tahani. Seeing them all celebrating dancing together just made my heart really happy. Mm -hmm. I love all of these people and I was just so happy to get to see them have like a fun last evening together. Yeah, at this point they all think they're doomed. Yeah, they really do. They think that they're going to the bad place the next morning and this is the last chance they have Mm -hmm. to be together and to be happy. Mm Mm-hmm. And we had a listener and a couple of people on Reddit actually point out that the song that they're dancing to is Green Light by Lord. So that's pretty cool. I'm a little sad that we didn't get to hear the chorus, but still really cool. I thought it was nice. Super subtle, too. (laughs) But if you don't know the name. I guess if you don't know the name. And we didn't hear the chorus, so it actually is kind of subtle. I mean, the attention to detail is great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out, Zoe. So Michael's human starter kit. He's got some great stuff in there that we didn't really get to see. He's got this little like banana container. You're basically just supposed to put a banana in it and it keeps it from hitting other things, which might make it kind of mushy in your lunch bag. It's the stupidest thing ever, but it's it's useful, but it's so dumb. Like it's useful, but it's also incredibly bulky. So yeah. most people don't buy one. And it wouldn't work if your banana had any curve on it or anything. Yeah, exactly. Or if it was a straight banana. Mm, Those straight bananas. Can't trust them. Mm. There was also a whisk. Yes, the whisk. Not really sure what the whisk was about. It's very boring and plain. Mm, And what is he going to whisk? There was like, I think it was a bobblehead. Like a dog bobblehead. Oh, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And the dumb corporate logo on the stress ball was the logo for Lonely Girl Margarita Mix for One. Of course it was. Which is Eleanor's drink of choice, right? So that was great. And then, of course, we... I I just really love the dance scene. I feel like I just want it to be 20 minutes long. I just want to watch them dance and have fun because they're adorable. I love that Janet does the little moonwalk and you actually see that she's floating. I love that she's dancing with Jason at one point. So maybe they're getting along now. 
and Tahani's like ballroom dancing with Michael, which felt very like father father daughter kind of dance. It was, it was very, very sweet. elegant, mm-hmm. very high class. Yeah, and of course the crowning jewel, Eleanor and Chidi slow dancing with Eleanor's hand on Chidi's heart, and he grabs it and just like pulls her a little bit closer and she pulls herself closer and she just she looks really sad at that moment like she's really gonna miss him you know and i'm just gonna cry if i keep talking about it so i'm (laughs) gonna stop talking about it but it's a really sweet moment guys so yeah can i just have like 20 minutes of them having fun because i want to watch that just 20 oh. minutes of them dancing. And there's the really great little dance move where Eleanor's pretending to, like, fish, and Michael pretends to be the fish on the hook, and she's, like, reeling him in. Well, it's I never really noticed sweet. that. It's <laughs> It's so cute. I love it. I love it so much. Oh, hmm. uh, yeah. And I really want to know what Michael was laughing about, because when we flash over to all of them sitting in the courtyard having their little picnic, he's bursting out laughing because of something that happened in version one but of course they don't remember and janet's saying that's mean they don't remember you shouldn't yeah. say that <laughs> yeah oh man i want to know so many good moments in season one though yeah oh okay so then we get our twist they're gonna go to the real bad place and yeah. see a judge which <laughs> who might have predicted that i don't know like did you might possibly oh, brought that up maybe, last episode maybe I mean, that wasn't the only thing you predicted last episode. <laughs> oh, it's not. <laughs> if you guys stuck around for the bloopers, I predicted that line about the bad place was the friends we made along the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty good. I called it. I was really excited when we were watching it live. She really was. I was so pumped. I'm pretty sure I was speechless or I just emitted a very high-pitched sound. Maybe only dogs could hear it. <laughs> so at this point, I'm super, super excited. I can't wait to see the real bad place. I'm just pumped at this point for the rest of the season. What about you? I'm very excited to see where the show takes us in the next three episodes. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be very familiar territory for us. I think we're going to see a lot of interiors like we have uh, in Michael's workplace. Okay. I think we're going to see a lot of rooms or doors leading into rooms, which are personal hells or torture Ooh. chambers okay that's my prediction uh I, I i feel like we're gonna see a lot of demons obviously acting very business as usual like oh mondays you know and they've got like i don't know a human slung over their shoulder on fire or something or i just assumed that they were gonna have like a garfield mug by the way you said mondays <laughs> basically i mean that does sound like the bad place to me like rip oh. a cat in half it's a party right <laughs> I think it's going to be very business as usual. Okay, cool. I don't think they're going to be too effects heavy. I wonder how they're going to walk through the real bad place well, they're all in gonna, plain sight. They're going to don disguises. Mm, so they're all going to dress fun. as like repairmen or mechanics oh, or God. plumbers. Ooh. Be like Eleanor in a plumber's hat like, oh, just coming to fix the pipes. No, I think it's going to be Tahani, remember? She works those cargo pants. Right. Or maybe a they'll be, <laughs> or maybe they'll be like pizza delivery guys or something, something, oh something God. silly, like, or Michael's leading them through the office as if they're prisoners or something, like, okay, okay, cool. right under their noses. Hmm, I like it. Those are my predictions. Very cool. So, how did you feel seeing the neighborhood fall into non-existence? I was surprised and sad. Yeah, me too. I was surprised that they actually showed it all folding up and disappearing and seeing the landmarks and the places we know and we've gotten used to and familiarized ourselves with. And like, Mm -hmm. it's almost like our little home as well. Yeah. And it's just folded up and gone. The lake drains Mm -hmm. and it reminded me and spoilers for Buffy, but it reminded me of the end of Buffy when Sunnydale just becomes a giant crater crater really yeah uh and the setting that we've gotten so used to and so comfortable with is just gone so we're left in new territory right which is exciting but also a little bittersweet i mean i don't think it's the last that we're gonna see of the neighborhood no okay i think that there's a situation that's gonna come up at some point 
probably early season three, maybe, or maybe mm. even the finale of season two, where their neighborhood gets remade. Janet makes a new one. Okay. I'm going to go on the other end and say we're never going to see it again. Okay. Yeah. I like that. I feel like this is commitment. This place is done. Moving on to the next stage of the show. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I'm very excited. We've got another episode tomorrow, and I'm pumped. So, shall we get to our mailbag? I think our song is very fitting. Mm-hmm. Let's, Let's read, read the, the mail from, from the mailbag section. section. Let's read the mail from the mailbag section. Ding, 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 ding,
Obviously, I can't end the debate about faith as being irrational, but it's worth noting that sometimes a leap of faith is based on rational evidence. If we're talking about religion, Mm -hmm. which the show has gone out of its way to tell us there's no religion that we know of that is the real one. Yeah, there's no one true religion that is accurate. Right. And I... I mean, I do have to disagree with your point about getting on an airplane and having faith in the airplane, not despite not knowing how it works. Mm-hmm. I have faith in the airplane, not because I don't know how it works, but because I know how it works. Mm. But I see, I, I get on a plane, I don't really know how it works. Not in depth. I just know like plane, something about aerodynamics, something, something math. Also, it just goes fast. So yeah, you that's have, about my knowledge. But you also, <laughs> you have faith in the engineers and the people who come up with the idea. Absolutely. Not yeah. just that it's going to, you know, stay up in the air. I have faith in other people and their ability to figure that stuff out because I can't. And that type of so. faith is very non-religious. Mm, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's I feel it's, like it's there's, so. there's religious faith and mm-hmm. very obviously non-religious faith. Yeah. But no, I I don't disagree with the idea that a leap of faith can be based on rational evidence, though. I feel like you can have evidence of something and then still need that leap of faith to really believe. But is that a religious faith? Because I don't think that's a religious faith. I think a, a f- having faith in somebody being able to do the dishes when you're away, that's very different. Mm-hmm. It's almost just like belief. I feel like faith is belief without rational reasoning. Mm. But there are a lot of philosophers that did spend their lives finding rational reasons and like proof of God's existence, right? And working their arguments around that. So I don't know. I don't think it's in, I don't think that faith ought to automatically is irrational mm-hmm. yeah, i think, I think that's be. where i end that comment <laughs> but and uh, it's, it's a very broad topic of conversation like there's no way yeah like you're absolutely right there's no way anybody could really debate this or end the debate it's yeah all, it's all about people's beliefs mm-hmm. and what they feel is their version of faith yeah and faith versus trust where's that line it's mm-hmm. a fine line so, and I just don't feel like I can speak to this really accurately because yeah. I don't. <laughs> we don't have that religious. Have, like, I, I'm not religious at all. So that's, that's another little part about me. And even though I did go to Catholic school, you better believe I didn't read the Bible. So I don't really know that much about it. I mean, I know stuff, general knowledge, but in-depth stuff, if someone was like, oh, yeah, who are all the books? written by in the bible Mm. i can name a few probably could you name like five from the old testament oh no john paul old testament yeah no no you got me right there (laughs) solomon was he one of the guys that's a religious name yes okay yeah see this is my extent of uh my religiosity so (laughs) i think ezekiel was in there Ooh. Okay. I know Numbers is in there. Numbers? Yeah, it's not a person, but... Oh, okay. I was like, that's most, a dumb I name. think that's the most boring chapter in the Bible ever. So thank you, Fred, for your message. Our next message comes from Paul at that Paul Moffitt on Twitter. So now you had a little bit of a conversation on Twitter, um, and I just, I just want to say it out loud because it's great. I thought it was awesome. Um... So last week, I talked a little bit about how I felt uncomfortable that Derek was a willing sex slave for Mindy, and this is what you had to say about it. On Derek's willing sex slave line, you aren't the only one to find it troubling. There are a few angles from which to approach the problematic nature of that moment, but I think at the core, it is the willing sex slave, in quotes, and I think the core of the problem here is that it's not possible to be a willing slave. A slave, by definition, is not willing. 
the language of willing sex slaves comes from BDSM, where slave and master is a common nomenclature, but those are in actual relationships grounded in trust. Mindy is literally going to have Derek as a semi-sentient possession that she will use for sexual gratification. So the language of willing sex slave is troubling in this context because it inevitably raises a question of consent. Can Derek give informed consent if he lacks the mental capacity to understand the situation? And in the absence of consent, can he be said to be willing? And I don't think he can be. And that's a problem. My thoughts on this are, if the wording was different, it would be okay. Okay. So, Derek is essentially a sex doll. Yep. Or just a real doll. People don't ask for consent with a sex doll. Yeah. Or a any kind of companion doll. No. So what's the difference? Is it just the the fact that it was he was called a willing sex slave? Hmm. I did get another comment from someone else on Twitter who said that the Derek sex slave thing did make them uncomfortable as well. So I was just really glad to see that somebody else felt the same. I think Alan joined into that conversation as well. Yeah, he did. So he says, is Derek a person and can a non-person be a slave? And I think Alan's coming from the same place that I am. Can a non-person be a slave? Janet created him as a romantic relationship surrogate. He could be seen as sophisticated by our robot creating standards. Romantic companion robot. Can you abuse such a thing? Isn't that what he was made for? Mm -hmm. And then Paul lied from kind of my standpoint is that's why the language is so important. Him calling himself a sex toy wouldn't have bothered me, but calling him a willing sex slave implies that such a thing even exists. But that said, I think there are actually, I think there are actually are ethical issues with abusing a sex robot. Interesting. Okay. Now... So, is there an ethical way to treat a sex robot? I think there could be. Because it's it a reflection could bleed on out humanity? To, yeah, I guess maybe it could bleed out to, like, your interactions with other people, but... To be honest, I haven't thought too much about the ethical problems with companion dolls. Well, I have a well, I don't have a problem with that, but going from from that is that comment of I think there actually are ethical issues with abusing a sex robot is where do you stop if you have a sex robot and you have ethical problems in or ethical issues in how you treat it? Mm-hmm. Where does that stop when you put that online maybe you have a a doll in virtual reality that you like to interact with (laughs) i don't know maybe it's your thing but where does that stop does that is there an ethical way to treat a virtual character in a virtual space that's just Mm -hmm. on a computer it's ones and zeros yeah does that reflect who you are in real life does that bleed into your actual interactions with people in your daily in your day-to-day life Yeah, I don't know. And I think it's something that we're exploring more and more as these things become our reality. Absolutely. We're starting to get more and more technologically advanced. Mm -hmm. There's new virtual reality applications popping up every day. Yeah. There's higher quality companion dolls being created. Yeah, frighteningly realistic ones. So So these are questions that people are going to have to start talking about and discussing. Yeah, so I'm glad you guys brought it up. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. We don't have an answer for you. No, we don't. (laughs) Um, I think that's something that you're going to have to answer for yourself. Yeah, and I think it's just, it's nice to start the conversation somewhere, you Mm -hmm. know? So, thanks, guys. And just to finish off, Alan said, Mindy's situation is the most horrifying to me. An eternity of solitary confinement, a never-ending addiction, no resources to grow and evolve, Adding Derek to that was funny, but makes it even more disturbing, which also is part of what I felt a little bit uncomfortable with because Mindy has zero problems with this idea. She doesn't know who Derek is. She has no idea that he was created by Janet. She doesn't think about his personhood. She just reads the note and goes, yep, okay, sounds legit, and just grabs him. Yeah, she has no idea that janet created him and what his history is and or who he is or if he is Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so mindy's lack of looking for consent is a little concerning anyway 
So thanks, everybody, for your messages. Uh, we love to see them. If you have any for the next episode, make sure that you tag it with F Bullshirt or send us an email so we can see everything you've got to say. All right, Jason, do you have anything else to say before we finish up for the week? If anybody watches the Josh Hutchison, Eliza Coop show Future Man on, I believe, it's Hulu, there's a moment in this episode that reminded me of a moment in episode of Future Man oh. when Michael talks about kissing and how your mouths are not for that. Like, oh. that's gross. <laughs> you just mash your food holes. And and there's a moment in Future Man when they mention kissing is gross because why would you go rat hole to rat hole? Because <laughs> what else do you call the hole that you stuff rats into? Like, why would you... <laughs> I thought it was a very similar moment. I thought it was great. So many people grossed out by a beautiful, affectionate act. Yep. Which can be, at times, very disgusting. Mm Mm-hmm. All right. So that brings us to the end of Forking Bullshirt, a Multiverse Radio production. If you like the show, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. We love to read them. It makes us feel all warm and fuzzy inside, so... Oh, it makes me feel like how I feel when I see Eleanor and Chidi being adorable. So if you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and we're on Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. And if you have lengthy thoughts, you can email us from our website, www.multiverseradio.ca. I just thought of that song. www. I want to be with you. www. Oh, Prozac. Where are you now? Ah. In the bad place. (laughs) Harsh. (laughs) Probably true. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. That's it. It does it. Yeah. That wasn't an answer. So that was good on my part. (laughs) Um, Those weren't also words. No, (laughs) I was like. (laughs) It just sounded like I had a bad connection. (laughs) (laughs) I thought you were dropping a beat. I like it. Rap album. Um. (laughs) <laughs> rap album? <laughs> I thought you were going to say rap battle. <laughs> rap album. Oh, rap Dropping album. my mixtape. Right. Okay. <laughs>